welcome to Against the Law, the show where we go through tales of yore. We focus on topics from throughout ancient history and we hope to unravel the facts from the mystery. You'll find we uncover misconceptions sometimes, in which case the gavel will crack down three times. It's a clever conceit, derived from a pun. Against the law has more meaning than one. But I'm not alone in this gargantuan task. Who else is here with me, I imagine you ask? This podcast is usually comprised of just four, but today is a treat. Today we have more. There's Xenia, per usual, and first in this poem, she's bringing the knowledge about ancient Rome. We also have Meg, a lyrical geek who loves to orate about things ancient Greek. There's Barney, who adores the ancient Near East. And who else do we have? Well, last but not least, Dr Valerie, the classicist, joins these three to link ancient Greek and Bedouin poetry. I'm your host, and of history there's not much I know, but I'm willing to sit here and go with the flow. As will you, our dear listener, as you join me today, so let's hear what the podcast team have to say. Before we begin, let's extend some fanfare to our new Patreon supporters, both of whom are called Claire. With your support, we can keep making the show, which is truly the best gift any Wong could bestow. Okay, so... Dr. Valerie, would you care to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your area of expertise? Sure. Well, I I started out life as a pretty standard classicist. After I finished my dissertation, I was looking around for traditions of poetry performed in community that were still living and that's when I came across this tradition of, of uh, Bedouin poetry, which is called Nabati in Arabic. And I also found the work of Dr. Saad Swayan, and his PhD thesis is called Nabati poetry. And he's explored the ways in which this primarily oral tradition shaped Bedouin culture and society. Um, But since then, there has been a really fascinating um, and inspiring renaissance of Bedouin poetry and communal poetry online and um, through new media. So there is a show on Abu Dhabi television called Al Shar Al Million, uh, The Millions Poet. And it's sort of a take on American Idol or X Factor, except all the, con- all the contestants are poets, men and women, um, who compose in Arabic and come from around the Arab world. So if Dr. Suwayan wrote his original work um, as a sort of way to preserve this tradition that he felt was moving into the past, I, I think now it's it's taken on a sort of new life, which to me is is quite interesting. Of course, as a classicist, I'm I'm looking at this in terms of what I studied before, with primarily Greek tragedy, but more generally in the ways in which uh, poetry existed in ancient society and how people interacted with it and what its various functions were. I've got to check out that show. It's really, you're right, from a modern point of view, you wouldn't think that maybe um, a poetry show where you have competitors doing their their poetry would be a thing anymore. But I'm so glad that there is an audience for that. So from a modern perspective, um, I think of poetry as things like limericks and rhyming couplets, things that we learn at school, and there's usually you know, a set format that poetry takes. But how is that different in the ancient world? In ancient Greece and later in ancient Rome, I think poetry was just almost an omnipresent part of life. And now um, we think of things that we learn at school and maybe we think of things that are a little bit more informal, like limericks you see on Twitter, or maybe it's just my corner of Twitter. And I think there's a sense, at least in, in America, that that's not really like 
proper poetry because it's not serious. But of course, if we look at the ancient world and we have the epigrams of Marshall and they're definitely, I mean, he's serious. He's seriously passionate. He's seriously angry. But, you know, he's not dealing with elevated topics, right? <laughs> he's ranting about people. <laughs> Um, and Catullus, I mean, if you if you look at Catullus, he's eminently literate, right? Because he's playing all these different word games with meter and different forms of words. But he's also being very sketchy, <laughs> I guess. He's he's again, he's not really dealing. I mean with elevated topics he's talking about his love affairs he's talking about people he hates he's he's spreading gossip but in the arab world or at least in in the bedouin tradition that i've been looking at uh since i defended my thesis i think poetry is still uh, really everywhere people will go like they'll just record poems in their cars you know They'll, they'll just be hanging, hanging or just hanging out with their friends and put their phone on and just record a video. I was reading through this book that was uh, written or I guess compiled by uh, Marcel Kupischek, who is an Arabic philologist and also a diplomat. And when he was in Saudi Arabia in the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s, uh, one of his friends knew of his interest in Arabic poetry and said, well, there's this guy I want you to meet, You've, but we've got to go out in the desert to find him because he he's a traditional Bedouin. He wants to keep living in his tent with his camels. He doesn't want to live in the city. So they went out to Wadi al Dawasir in Saudi Arabia and they found um, uh, this poet who went by the name Ad-Dindan, what he would do is after he, you know, seen to his herd of camels for the day, people would sort of gather around him and they would listen to him recite this poetry. And I think some of it he had composed, if you like, in his head. Um, but some of it seems to be a bit freestyle. Oh, and an important fact about Zindan, he was illiterate. This is fascinating. It sounds so much like what you were saying about Homer last time, Meg. Yeah, I was just about to say, this sounds like Milman Parry. Um, so Milman Parry did a very similar thing um, when he visited sort of Bosnian uh, singers. And they were often, as you were saying, Valerie, they were often um, illiterate as well. But they could memorise and perform these really, really long poems um, from memory. They're called Guzlars, these singers. And then, and he kind of realised that they were using these formulae, these uh, sort of repeated phrases, so that they could, you know, um, make up the songs as they went along or edit bits or change things and perform it all from memory. But there are these kind of set aspects of them. Um, and they might be thousands and thousands of lines. And then he was like, this is, I'm hearing Homer. This is the closest we're going to get to hearing Homer, these 12,000 line long poems or whatever. Um, and that was the sort of one of the early... Uh, sort of interventions in the study of Homer as oral poetry. But it's so interesting, it sounds so similar, this idea of kind of going to visit a community, hearing their work um, and kind of comparing it. Yes, absolutely. In a lot of ways, ancient society and some modern societies, like I would still say uh, the Bedouin or people in, in the Gulf, do still see poetry as as part of life. You know, you you, you sit around with your friends and you create something or you sing something. I do think the modern world has a different take on poetry. I know that in in my uh, English school education that um, a lot of the time people thought that uh, anything older than sort of the 80s was you know ancient in terms of, of in terms of poetry and I love said about Catullus being, you know a poet who did actually quite bawdy and sketchy topics. Uh, we think of Shakespeare as this stuffy ancient thing but actually it's um if you look at Shakespeare's work a lot of it is almost a bawdy soap opera that anybody could go and enjoy and and still there's this perception if you think of Shakespeare it must be serious and we must all gaze into the empty sockets of a skull whilst contemplating life and death um I'd love to um 
move it into a sort of almost like elevator pitch style introduction to their um, ancient uh, area of expertise and poetry. If you could do sort of like um, almost like a minute or under, uh, there's a popular radio show in the UK called Just a Minute where you have to keep your keep your intro under a minute. If if everyone's up to that challenge, and Barney, would you be happy to start? Sure. Fab. Okay, so elevator pitch me your uh, ancient Near East encapsulated in under a minute information on poetry. Go. Okay, so in um, ancient Near Eastern literature, uh, there's quite a lot of poetry in both Akkadian and Sumerian. Um, I learned Akkadian, so I'll probably just focus on that. Um, but one of the problems that we have when thinking about poetry in the ancient Near East is terminology. Because um, we think of poetry as part of literature that's sort of opposed to prose. Um, and in the ancient Near East, um, a lot of the texts that have come down to us, uh, like hymns and prayers, take the form of poetry. So do you call that poetry or do you call it religious literature, for example? It's not always distinct from religious writing poetry in the ancient Near East. Um, and then another thing to think of is that um, it's difficult to separate from from the oral performance. So obviously what we've got is texts of, of poems and various other literature, uh, be it, you know, myths or liturgical forms. Um, but these obviously would have been read out. Uh, Stephanie Daly, who's a great Oxford Assyriologist, uh, thinks that what we've got is the bare bones of Akkadian poetry in the text and that they would have been embellished uh, upon because the, the vocab is often quite... Um, quite parsimonious, quite small. And so I think it's sort of a bit like having musical notation that was then improvised uh, on top of. The just a minute rules would be out of the window there <laughs> if we're not allowing like repetition and hesitation. <laughs> this is going to be hard. It is going to be very hard. And since you've picked up on how difficult it is, Meg, I'm going to put, put the onus on <laughs> you to, to, to go next. Um, okay, so early, early Greek literature, the Homeric epics, mm -hmm. my favourite thing in the world. Um, I've, I speak about Homer all the time. This is sort of 8th, 7th century BC, and they're really, really long, like really long. So this is kind of what I was talking about with Milman Parry's work. Um, so he was looking at these bards who do, you know, 12,000 lines long poems from memory. And Homer, Homeric epics are very similar. The Iliad is 15 and a half thousand lines. The Odyssey is over 12,000 lines. Um, and they're in a meter called dactylic hexameter, which is really fun. Um, I can read you out a line if you like. Yes, please. I, I, I normally talk about the Iliad, and last week I went on a bit of a rant about how much I actually don't like the Odyssey, but I thought I'd, you know, branch out a bit this week. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's the, uh, the first line of the Odyssey. Um, and I'm not very good at this. This is not my area of expertise, the meter, but try and hear the meter because it is amazing. In fact, I'll give, you, I'll give you two lines. I'll give you a special treat. Um Andramoi enne pe muza polutropon hos mala polla, plag te pe troyes yaron polietron epersen. Sorry, I got lost there. Um, but so it's made up of these long and short syllables, and sometimes that's about the length of the vowel or other features. And it's very, very rhythmical. So, kind of like we've been saying, this all would have been performed, performed from memory, composed in your head, and then spoken. Um, so, what we have written down, just like what Barney was saying, it's, it's not everything. It's a sort of version of it written down. Um, but primarily, these are poems that were performed. And just a final fact for you, it would take 30 hours to sing the Iliad from start to finish and about <laughs> 20 hours to sing the Odyssey. <laughs> so that is a 50 hour long performance if you do both of them. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that would be well worth the money for the ticket if you went there. You'd be mm. getting your money's worth if you went to a live performance it has such a beautiful sort of rhythmic cadence mm. uh and i i wonder how much is lost when we translate uh ancient poetry into english or into other languages how much do we lose and there must be a yeah. whole um a whole set of rules and 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 um artistic uh choices to be made when you translate things because you don't want to mm. lose that amazing bouncing rhythm do you and some people have tried to write English poetry in the meter of Homeric epic, which is this kind of dum da da dum 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 da da dum 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 da da dum dum. That is roughly the rhythm of um, dactylic hexameter. But it just doesn't sound right in English. You need the kind of strange sounds of ancient Greek, I think. 
Gosh, that sounds like almost like military drums, that rhythm. It's got um, these like, the dactyl is like dum da da. It's like long, short, short. And then you get some spondies in there, which is long, long. So it's a kind of combination of those two uh, metrical units. It's really beautiful to beautiful li- to listen to. In fact, if there is any uh, audio book of that, I think I'll, I shall listen to that and pretend I know what I'm listening to and feel very, very <laughs> well educated by the end. <laughs> Did, did anyone catch um, 2016? There was an online performance of the entire Iliad and then the entire Odyssey in English translation. Yes, yeah, um, it was that was amazing, and it, they got actors to do it, didn't they? It was, yeah. Yes, yes, they got they got actors to do. I mean, they they also got some uh, classicists to, mm. to do it as well. I had some friends who were doing parts of it which was how I first found out about mm. it. It was it was really amazing. I was just transformed. I mean, you know, when when you read something, especially for, for school or for an assignment, that's one thing. And I mean, I, I loved the Iliad when I read it, but seeing it performed just really mm. brought it to life. Yeah, absolutely. I remember the first time I heard someone speak any of it in ancient Greek. Um, it was when I was doing my undergraduate degree and I was just like, oh my God, this is incredible. I've been missing so much. So Xenia, are you ready? Let's hear your ancient Roman elevator pitch, please. Okay, so the Romans hugely respected the Greeks' capacity for epic poetry. And as such, epic poetry really, really didn't take off in ancient Rome until like the, um, the first century BC with, um, well, there was one before the Aeneid, but it wasn't very good, quite frankly. <laughs> and with a, with a major epic poem called the Aeneid written by Virgil. Now, Virgil was actually commissioned to write this by the Emperor Augustus. Um, So it was, in a sense, a political piece of poetry um, because it was trying to sort of create this Roman identity through epic and also link that back and embed Roman identity within Greek history and within the Greek epic tradition. So it was very, very deliberate, the fact that this was epic and the fact that this was written during... um, Uh, quite a revolutionary, shall we say, political period. But in terms of other types of poetry that the Romans enjoyed, um, Dr. Valerie earlier mentioned Catullus, which is love poetry. Um, Ovid also wrote love poetry. Um, And you also get these little, uh, they're called epigrams. They're just tiny, like maybe a couple of lines, maybe two or three lines, shorter, more fun poems that are making sort of social commentary. Um, I was going to say like the kinds of things that you might find you know there's a couple of lines type poems that you find on Instagram or a couple of lines that you might find written uh in graffiti on a wall somewhere those are the kinds of things that we have at epigrams and I believe they started out actually in ancient Greece as like funeral poems so you'd have a little epigram composed um for your gravestone um and then that evolved into more sort of commentary type poetry is that right Meg? Yes, and I was just going to say, I think we've mentioned them before in the context of commemoration. Mm. Um, you get little uh, sort of commemorative epigrams. And there was, I think I read one out about, uh, that appeared on a memorial um, at the site of the uh, Battle of Thermopylae, which mm-hmm. the Form 300 is about. Yeah. So you just get poetry used in loads of everyday circumstances. And um, I've got this kind of theory I've not researched or proven it at all, but it's just a tiny little theory <laughs> <laughs> that effect that like pop songs are our modern version of what ancient poetry was like. Um, I know we've done a few episodes now on music in the ancient world, but I, I really think that today in songs, that's where we get some of our most profound thoughts, and that sometimes rhymes, that sometimes doesn't rhyme. Um, I don't know, I'm not like hugely musically minded. So when I listen to a song, I'm usually actually listening to the lyrics. And often I'll be like absolutely obsessed with the way a singer has chosen to phrase something and then or maybe repeat a certain point in the chorus. Um, That really fascinates me. And I I hear a lot of echoes of the kind of sentiments that are expressed in ancient poetry, but in modern pop songs. I love that theory. And can I endorse it? Because... Mm -hmm. When we look at how poetry was performed, because one one of the things that I I meant to bring out earlier but didn't was that 
sometimes in the modern context we think of poetry or enjoying poetry as sort of sitting with a cup of tea, reading a book, quietly thinking about life. But in the ancient world, uh, this would have been performed. People didn't read silently, uh, right? So if you wanted to perform, a, if you wanted to enjoy poetry, it would involve somebody's voice. Maybe not yours, but somebody's. If we think about uh, how in the modern world we separate poetry and music, like you were saying, um, in ancient Greece, there really wasn't this distinction because the word that they use, mus musique, which is the same word, um, encompassed both singing and poetry and dancing. Isn't it also funny, just on that etymology note, that the way we use the phrase music and lyrics, the, the word lyrics comes from the Greek word lyre, and lyric poetry is poetry that's sung to a lyre or other accompaniment. So when we say music and lyrics, that's just music and music, you know? Right, yes, yes, exactly, exactly, yes. That's a little against the law. Lyrics isn't the words, lyrics is the music. <laughs> On the topic of lyrics, and, and then what Xenia mentioned earlier, um, about uh, music being, you know, where poetry might be situated more popularly in, in the modern world, um, have you seen those memes that say, like, what's happened to songwriting? And it'll be like comparing i don't know kanye west to freddie mercury or something like that and how eloquent freddie mercury was and how kanye but like i mean it's it's stupid it's a complete fallacy anyway but i really enjoy on the freddie mercury topic when people post the meme with just like i want to ride my bicycle yeah. over and over again i love that what a tune <laughs> it's <is> brilliant <laughs> poetry lyrics <laughs> can i can i jump in about serious poetry or Yes, please. Non-serious poetry. What a uh, question for uh, Flo, Barney and Xenia. What's my favourite poem in ancient Greek? The Iliad. QI buzzers. Beep, <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my favourite poem in ancient Greek is the Batraca Mia Machia. Um, I don't know if we've ever discussed this before. No. What is it? I think it is the best thing in the world and it is the battle of the frogs and mice so a batrakos is a frog a mus is a mouse and the maca means battle um and it's a sort of parody poem about a battle between mice and frogs and it's all about a you know the prince of the mice uh, and the king of the frogs are going on a little trip across the lake together and then they're attacked by a water snake and the prince of the mice dies and the frog king forgets about him because the mouse can't swim and then the other mice are like frog king you're done get out of here we're coming to fight you because you've let our prince die and there's this huge battle between the mice and the frogs but Zeus intervenes because the mice are about to win and he sends an army of crabs <laughs> to protect the frogs um, and the mice retreat and the war ends and it lasts a single day and it's just so, it's a parody poem but it's like it's you know it uses this sort of serious language the serious epic meter and my favorite thing about it is in the ancient world it was attributed to Homer so they were like <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's obviously not by Homer or it's obviously not by the same person who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, whoever that was, or composed the Iliad and the Odyssey, sorry. Um, but it's I just love the idea that they were like, yep, yeah, this sounds like Homer. This is this is pretty, pretty damn Homeric. <laughs> so that's my favourite poem. That is amazing. I need to check that out. It sounds like the Nutcracker, like the ballet. It, yes. Yeah, it really is. If you're enjoying the podcast so far, why not support us on Patreon? Our different support tiers can get you merch, shout outs, and even personalised content. If you want to hear more from Against the Law, find us on Twitter at Against Law, and we're on Instagram and TikTok. Search for at Against the Law Podcast. Maybe we should all share, I mean, I can't, um, but maybe we should all share our favourite um except of ancient poetry everyone has something that mm. they could share so meg that was was that your favorite yeah fab that's my favorite uh, that's that's mine <laughs> lovely okay well barney i'm gonna go with you do you have a favorite bit and maybe do you even know any in in the original language Yes, definitely. And what I said earlier with the elevator pitch um, about the fact that there's some problems of, with sort of terminology with poetry um, in Akkadian, um, there's also problems with the kind of critical um, description and appreciation of it. So like 
um, syllables and counting syllables and the length of, of sounds um, is not a base for the poetry in Akkadian or it doesn't appear to be. And people have looked at, you know, thousands of lines of what is poetry and can't work out many, if any, metrical rules. Um, but the example that I'm going to give now always sticks in my mind. It's a single couplet. I think I've mentioned it in translation before. But you listen to this and tell me that this doesn't sound like poetry with some sort of, you know, meter and rhyme and, and everything like that. Um, so this is from um, a poem called Ishtar's Descent to the Underworld uh, about the god, the, the god of war and love, Ishtar. She goes down to rescue her lover from the underworld. And here's the Akkadian of this couplet. Ushela mituti ikalu baltuti. Eli Baltuti Imaidu Bituti. Ooh, so Tuti means something important, I'm guessing. <laughs> Actually, that Uti sound is um, is either a female plural or like a sort of a noun that's been, or, um, something that's been abstracted. Yes, and in this case, it means uh, I shall raise the dead, they will devour the living. Oh, you've read this to us before, I think. Yes, I have read it to you before. Yeah, it's terrifying, I think. It's, yeah. The metal song lyrics. Yeah, it's a threat uh, to the gatekeeper. Um, yeah. yeah, and I just, you know, even in, in this here, we've got, you heard me say tutti a lot. What it is, is me tutti, uh, which is the dead, and bal tutti, which is the living. So they're both in plural. And they're crossed over in, in the, between the two lines of the couplet. So you have me tutti and then bal tutti in the first, and then bal tutti and me tutti in the second part. Um, which is, well, I think, what I learned in Latin as a chiasmus. Yeah, like abba. What does chiasmus mean? A, chias a chiasmus is like an abba structure, right? A B B A. Is that what, yeah. is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I thought yeah. I got okay, excited. Cool. I thought at, by abba you meant gimme, 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 <laughs> and I was very, very excited then. <laughs> also um, poetry, obviously. Uh, absolutely poetry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, Valerie, would you like to share some of your favourite ancient poetry? Uh, when people ask me for my favourite line of Greek poetry, I, I always go with the opening lines of the Iliad. So, So, rage, sing, goddess, of Peleus' son, Achilles accursed that sent many Achaeans to Hades. It, it, it really hooked me into Greek uh, before Greek was just a pile of grammar books that I wasn't really enthralled with, but it really turned me into a Hellenist, that and my, my undergraduate Greek professor. What a transformation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now ping over to Xenia because I feel like it's time to hear some ancient Roman poetry from you. Thank you. Um, so I've, I've been having a little think while everyone else went through theirs. Um, and I had a little look at Ovid, I had a little look at Horace, but I keep coming back to the two lines that really inspired me to do classics. And they're from Virgil's Aeneid. Arma virum que cano troia qui primus ab oris Italiam, fato profugus, da winaque venit litora. Isn't that lovely? Wow. Oh, what does that mean? It means I sing of weapons and a man who was the first to flee from the uh, from Troy to the Livinian shores. By fate, a fugitive. I love it. That was gorgeous, Senia. We're really getting into these first lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's what's so special about the first lines of the epic poems in particular because like the way Ovid starts his metamorphosis which is his version of an epic poem now Ovid usually writes love poetry but, um, and, and the kind of style in which he writes the epic is quite fun it's more storytelling -y, <laughs> like his love poems and that's what makes him so hilarious to read and such a genius in his own right but there's something like if you really want to just be super indulgent with your poetry and settle down and sort of, you know, strap in for the long ride, there's something about the start of epic poems, which is like, okay, here we go. Yeah. We're off on an adventure. Yeah, 
and they often start with that kind of like I'm gonna sing we're gonna sing or sing just like mm. it's gonna happen mm-hmm. are we am I sensing that we're sort of coming to a good place to think about our favorite things maybe from that we've learned from today's episode so Valerie I'm gonna start with you and give you the the um the first um dibs on your favorite thing that you've learned today what was your favorite thing my favorite thing was sort of the shared insight that pop songs uh, are our modern poetry our modern poetry performances i really like that uh and i'm i'm going to think more about it so it deserves its own sort of area of study i think i love it right um meg i'm going to hand over to you what was your favorite thing from today oh there were so many things i have to say i really loved the story dr valerie told us about the guy recording making these recordings of the illiterate bard singing just because it's so interesting in itself but also because of that amazing parallel with what mum parry did um I think it's just such an interesting idea, these kind of traditions that spring up and have have these similarities across time, across space. It's amazing. Um, yeah, I agree. That was a really nice, really nice uh, thing to learn. And Xenia, what about you? What was your favourite thing from today? Uh, yeah, I love the idea of the Millions Poetry competition as well. I think uh, I, I don't really like the, the kind of idea that something was better in the past or something was you know, or that we've lost some sort of um, cultural legacy. I think things just evolve. Um, and it's really nice to see how poetry evolves for uh, different audiences over time. We might think of poetry as being super elite today, but if we actually listen to how much poetry we're surrounded by, it's not elite at all. It's still with us. They are on Instagram, uh, Millions Poet. If you want to just... To just search up, they they will post little snippets of the show. It's all in Arabic, um, but it's it's sort of a fun way to see how they do things. Barney, your favourite thing, please. So my favourite thing today wasn't necessarily a specific thing that we learned, but was just the great privilege of hearing people read uh, in the original language. I think uh, we don't always get the chance to hear greek roman and akkadian on these podcasts and so it's lovely just to hear things out loud you know and frankly the greek was all greek to me and it still sounded great so that was my favorite thing hearing everyone's wonderful readings it was beautiful thank you barney and lastly i think my favorite has to be the ancient battle between the toads and the mice in meg's story um personally i'm team frog and so concludes today's epic. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. And once again, I'd love to say thank you to Claire and Claire, our wonderful new Patreon supporters. You're both going to feature in my next poem. <laughs> if you'd like to support us and get yourself some freebies, you too can find us on Patreon. Catch you next time for Against the Law. Against the Law.